Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here today for this very important event. A couple of comments before I get started. This is a wonderful opportunity to continue working as Surgeon General with partners around the country because our partnership to fight chronic disease has over 110 partners from academics, from business, from just every sector of life. It's a nonpartisan organization and really it allows me to continue doing what I did as Surgeon General of the United States in addressing the health needs, the gap in the health in the American population. Now, I did not plan to be Surgeon General of the United States. I'm still not sure how my name got thrown in there, to be honest with you. There's certainly a lot of great stories there. But partway through my academic career as a general vascular surgeon who subspecialized in trauma, burns, and critical care, and I ran the trauma system in Arizona, that's really what drove me into public health. And as a middle-aged attending professor, I went back to school at night and got my degree in public health, not because I thought I'd be Surgeon General, but because what I recognized was as a practicing academic surgeon, training residents and medical students and such as that, most of what I was caring for every day was preventable. Whether it was the acute trauma, what we call the knife and gun club, the stabbings and the domestic violence and drunk drivers and on and on and on that cost so much, or whether it was people that made bad decisions their whole life, people who led sedentary lives, ate the wrong food, uh, ate too much of the wrong food, smoked, drank excessively. When you start to look at the disease burden in society, a lot of it is really of our own bad behaviors that cause the problems that we have today. Chronic diseases, we can define them scientifically, but to the average American, these are the inevitable parts of getting old. You hear it all the time. Oh, well, older people get diabetes, older people get bad blood vessels, older people have heart attacks. When you look at pulmonary diseases, you know, isn't that just an inevitable part of aging? It is not. It is not. All of those seven diseases and many more that we characterize as chronic diseases are diseases that we really contribute to throughout our life. I published the 27th and 28th Surgeon General's reports on smoking. My predecessor, Luther Terry, published the first Surgeon General's report on smoking in 1964. And what we see over a half a century is, is that tobacco still remains the largest preventable cause of death in the nation. Almost a half a million people a year die from tobacco-related causes. Millions and millions of more suffer the deleterious effects, including secondhand smoke for those who are non-smokers. And so you have to start looking at what causes these problems. And then we look at another example within the prevention portfolio is the fact that we have 9 million children today who are overweight or obese. And those children not only are saddled with the struggles of obesity, because we, we focus on the type 2 diabetes that these children are having in unprecedented numbers now. And we even see hypertension in children in grammar school now related to that obesity. But we forget about the psychosocial effects, the mental health problems of an obese child. The child that doesn't get to play on the sports team, the child that doesn't get invited to the dances and the proms, are not the cool kids, and it's very devastating for them. They live a very shallow, sometimes marginalized life, and so we see mental health issues there, and that's a chronic disease as well. So as we look through all of these areas, and these are just two of the many under that prevention portfolio, it's clear that almost everything we're dealing with there is, is preventable. The fact is we spend over 16% of our gross national product on health care every year, and that equates to about $2.1 trillion. It's estimated that in the next decade or so, if we don't change the way we do business, we'll be spending over 20% of our gross national product on health care. That will be over $4 trillion a year. And what you heard Andrew tell you already this morning is that 75 cents of every dollar that you spend on health care, every single dollar spent on health care, 75 cents of every one is on a chronic disease, most of which is preventable or at least mitigatable. 40% of all cancers are preventable. Most cardiovascular disease, seven out of 10 people die from chronic diseases. So I mean, you have to pause and say, is there a better way to do business here? Our system is disproportionately weighted and incentivized that our providers are rewarded for waiting until you get sick. If you look at the way the books are written for coding, there's not a whole lot for prevention, very, very little. But there are telephone book size books that will tell you how to bill for heart surgery and vascular surgery and all kinds of other surgeries because the system is disproportionately weighted that way. 
What we need to engender is a cultural transformation that embraces health and wellness through prevention, and we have to create an infrastructure to be able to reward our providers for keeping you healthy. What a radical thought, that you could go sit with somebody and learn about nutrition, physical activity, or whatever you need in your life to improve your health status. That's a huge, huge endeavor because the economics, uh, the dollar flow uh, in our systems today, the incentives are all on the perverse side. That is, waiting for people to get sick and then making them better. And so we have this episodic care system that uh, we deal with. So prevention and the reasons for prevention are there. You've seen them on the storyboards. The fact of the, fact of the matter is we, we have to engender this cultural transformation. But in trying to spin this to get, as they say, traction in Washington for this problem, I have to compete with a lot of other things that were going on in Washington. And so it was clear to me that we had to look at prevention and we had to look at chronic disease in a different light. And I was able, on a couple of occasions, to be able to have national audiences and press conferences and talk about the workforce issues for chronic disease as well as national security. People said, well, what's the relationship? We don't get it. I said, well, let's just look at these 9 million kids who are overweight or obese, some of whom have hypertension and type 2 diabetes now. Let's fast forward a decade, decade and a half, and let's talk about how the Army will fill its spots, or the Navy or the Air Force. Let's talk about where our firemen and policemen will come from. Where will our smart community leaders who are physically able come from if I'm telling you that the cohort of youngsters that hopefully will get there won't be able to pass your test, won't be able to fill those jobs. So now it becomes a national security issue as we start thinking of workforce in the future. And it becomes very scary then because my CDC epidemiologist at the time said to me, Surgeon General, we have some concerns. As we look at the epidemiologic curves coming to the future, this could be the first generation of children that lives less than its parents for the first time in the history of the United States. So this is not only tragic, it is catastrophic. Because what it says is, is that as the disease burden mounts, the economic burden mounts, most of it's being caused by chronic disease, and we're kind of sitting passively saying, okay, who's going to pay for this? And of course, most of the time when leaders debate the health crisis, it's really about economics. Who pays? Rather than dealing with the chronic disease burden. And what we're trying to do is shift the particular debate to one that embraces prevention of chronic disease and thereby reducing the disease burden, the economic burden, improving the quality of life, decreasing the cost of care. We look at chronic disease and when we look at chronic disease in any given population of what we call minorities, all of those chronic diseases are higher. So we pay more. And the most disparate populations in the United States are Native American populations, which often the numbers reflect those of a third world country from chronic diseases. So Native Americans will die 10 to 20 years sooner. Their smoking rates are much higher than the average American rate. Maternal child mortality, childhood vaccination rates, adolescent suicide rates, all higher. Mental health problems, all higher. Chronic disease burden, higher. Sometimes we look the other way because those populations really aren't in our midst all the time, but yet we pay for them whether we know it or not. So there's a business case to be made to do something about chronic diseases, even if it's not the humanitarian case, which I think there is. And so that's why it's important, and we understand through the Partnership to Fight Chronic Disease, that the changes that the nation desperately needs to remove chronic disease burden from our society, reduce the cost of care, improve the quality of life, are at the local level. But the challenge for Surgeon General is the same as the challenge of all of you, all of your practitioners, administrators in your community. How do you take the best science the world has ever known, package it in a culturally competent manner, and deliver it to the thousands of diverse communities that we have in order to do one thing only, engender behavioral change. Eat a little less, walk a little more, don't smoke, don't drink excessively. And that sounds exceedingly simple. But the same science delivered to an affluent community in Los Angeles is a whole lot different than delivering it into Harlem or the South Bronx or, or Washington Heights where I grew up in New York City because of the cultural, because of the language barriers, and what resonates with those populations. We understand that at the Partnership to Fight Chronic Disease, which is why it's even more important that we partner with each and every one of you and the communities around the nation, because often you know the best practices. And we'll listen to you, and we'll work with you to help you put those best practices there so that the outcome is we affect this cultural transformation in the United States, 
which will result in the desired health endpoints of reducing chronic disease, creating a healthier America, and reducing the cost of care. Thank you all for coming together. I look forward to the panel discussion, and I'll be sitting there listening intently. Thanks. Thank